कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभो नित्यानंद So reading from Srimad Bhagavad Gita. So reading from uh, chapter 6, text number 5. Udara Rapman Atmanam Atmanam Abasadayat Atmai Lahi Atmano Bandu Rapmai Rupparapmanam Udara Rapman Atmanam Atmanam Abasadayat Atmai Lahi Atmano Bandu Rapmai Rupparapmanam Udara Rapman Atmanam Atmanam Abasadayat Atmai Lahi Atmano Bandu one must deliver. One must deliver. Atmana. Atmana. By the mind. By the mind. Atmanam. Atmanam. The conditioned soul. The conditioned soul. Na. Na. Never. Never. Atmanam. Atmanam. The conditioned soul. The conditioned soul. Avasadayet. Avasadayet. Put into degradation. Put into degradation. Atma. Atma. Mind. Mind. Eva. Eva. Certainly. Certainly. He. He. Indeed. Indeed. Atmana. Atmana. Of the conditioned soul. Of the conditioned soul. Bandhu. Bandhu. Friend. Friend. Atma. Atma. Mind. Mind. Eva. Eva. Certainly. Certainly. Vipu. Vipu. Enemy. Enemy. Atmana. Atmana. Of the conditioned soul. Of the conditioned soul. Translation by Shri Prabhupada. One must deliver himself with the help of his mind and not degrade himself. The mind is the friend of the conditioned soul and his enemy as well. Please repeat. One must deliver himself with the help of his mind. One must deliver himself with the help of his mind. And not degrade himself. And not degrade himself. The mind is the friend of the conditioned soul. The mind is the friend of the conditioned soul. And his enemy as well. And his enemy as well. Purple by Shri Prabhupada. The word Atma donates body, mind and soul dependent upon different circumstances. In the yoga system, the mind and the conditioned soul are especially important since the mind is the central point of yoga practice. Atma refers here to the mind. The purpose of the yoga system is to control the mind and to draw it away from attachment to sense objects. It is stressed therein that the mind must be so trained that it can deliver the conditioned soul from the mire of nations. In material existence, one is subjected to the influence of the mind and the senses. In fact, the pure soul is entangled in the material world because the mind is involved with the false ego, which desires to lord it over material nature. Therefore, the mind should be so trained that it will not be attracted by the glitter of material nature. And in, and in this way, the conditioned soul may be saved. One should not degrade oneself by attraction to sense objects. The more one is attracted by sense objects, the more one becomes entangled in material existence. The best way to disentangle oneself is always engage the mind in Krishna consciousness. The word he is used for emphasizing this point, that one must do, that one must do this. It is also said, Mana eva manushyanam. Karanam Banda Mukshayo Bandaya Vishaya Sango Muktya Nevishayam Mana. For man, mind is the cause of bondage, a mind is the cause of liberation. Mind absorbed in sense objects is the cause of bondage. A mind detached from sense objects is the cause of liberation. Amrit Bindu Upanishad too. Therefore the mind which is always engaged in Krishna consciousness is the cause of supreme liberation. Udhare Atman Atmanam Atmanam Avasadayat Atmai Vahe Atmanu Bandur 
So one must deliver himself with the help of the mind and not degrade himself. The mind is the friend of the conditioned soul and his enemy as well. So this is uh, Krishna's instructing Arjuna that there are uh, in the body there is two types. There is your friend and there is your enemy. Actually everybody thinks that because it's your body naturally we think that everything in the body is friendly because it's your body. So naturally you think that whatever is going on in my body that is uh, friendly. But actually we see that this is not a fact because there is also enemies. In the body there is enemies. And just as one should know his friends, one must also know who is the enemy. You see, because in the material world there is hostile uh, interest. Uh, just like we can understand that uh, in this material world there is many hostilities. There is hostility coming from material nature itself in the form of uh, adverse weather conditions uh, where there is shortage, uh, there is uh, hostility in the sense that there is uh, from other people, from animals. You see that sometimes the animals are very hostile. Insects, mosquitoes, things like that, they're also hostile to our happiness. And there is also hostility from the body in the form of disease. But there is also hostility from the mind. Mind is also hostile to our purpose. Because the nature of the mind is that the mind is the medium by which material energy works. You see, material energy, as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, that maya has captured some strategic points. Just like when an enemy takes over a city, then it, it, it always captures some strategic point. The television station is usually the first thing. The radio station, the television station, the airport. These are things that are first captured. If you're going to win a battle, then if you're attacking a city, then you have to capture strategic points. It's no good capturing the sweet shop. Is it? If you say, oh, I went and I captured the tobacco <coughs> shop, sweet shop, newspaper shop. You have to go to where is the center of communication. You see, communication is the thing which influences. Just like in any country, the radio is always saying, long live the prime minister or the president, or, long live the queen, and uh, everyone's going to be happy if they vote labor or if they vote uh, conservative. Or so many propagation is going on. Propaganda. So this propaganda work is actually uh, influencing the people. And similarly, in the material world, there is also propaganda. There is so much propaganda. And that propaganda is coming from the mind. You see, the mind's business is to drag the living entity, the soul, down down, 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 down. The two businesses of material energy is to cover over and to drag down. Just like if you attack someone, then the first thing you do is cover their eyes and then drag them down. Isn't it? Once you've covered their eyes, then it's easy to drag them down. Because they can't see what's going on. So therefore, when they can't see, then immediately they become confused, frightened, bewildered. Isn't it? And then it's not so difficult to drag them down. But if they can see, if they can see, then it will be more difficult to drag them down because they may see something to grab hold of. Isn't it? They may be able to capture something and hold on to it. So therefore, Maya's first business is Agyana Timurandasya. She is covered over with the ignorance, Avidya. This avidya, vidya means knowledge, and avidya means that she steals away the knowledge of the living entity. You see, she takes away actual knowledge. Knowledge is the eternal relationship with the soul. We are full of knowledge. Our nature is to be full of knowledge. We cannot exist without knowledge. 24 hours a day, 
We are searching after knowledge. Isn't it? 24 hours a day. When we get up in the morning, immediately, where's my toothbrush? Where's my toothpaste? Where did I leave my sweater or whatever? You see, where's the light? Isn't it? The first thing we want to do, we have to put on the light. So sometimes if you're in a, a, a room you're not conversing with, then the first thing you're trying to find the light. And if you don't know where the light switch is, you feel like a real idiot. So you may start looking around, then you find out it's not in the room at all, it's outside. <laughs> then you become very angry, you become very frustrated. Because you're thinking you know, but you don't know, so you become frustrated. Because by relative terms, you always think the light should be inside the room. But sometimes it's outside the room. You see, relativity. So therefore, we are searching for the moment we get up. Throughout the day, we are always, uh, if you like, inspecting. By our very nature, we are inspecting. Uh, we want to bring everything into an inspective mode. So as that to see what is favorable and what is unfavorable. Everyone is inspecting the material world. The nature of inspection is we want to see what is favorable. Just like when food comes along, you inspect it. Isn't it? What do you do when you see prashada? You inspect. Is there any curds up to there? Is there any pakoras? Any samosas today? You see? And if it's just a, a boiled... A, a, what do you call this? Parsnips. <laughs> And you think, oh, cheat it again. <laughs> Krishna doesn't like pasta. <laughs> so therefore, uh, our very nature, <clears throat> our very nature is to inspect. And that inspection is based upon what is favorable. We are always looking for that which is conducive to our happiness. You see, that's why when you are looking around in the material world, everyone is looking. We have eyes and we are observing phenomena, different types of phenomena, and we are seeing those things which are very tasty for ourselves. Just like a boy meets girl. So the boy is looking for a very tasty girl and the girl is looking for a very tasty boy. You see? And if they don't look, if he's got cross eyes and his nose is falling off, and they don't look twice. You see? This is the nature. So everybody is trying to look very tasty. Because in the material world, everything is based upon rasa. Rasa means that thing which gives taste. You see? Something which looks beautiful, it gives taste. Just like if you look at a, at a nice car, very well designed, you get some feeling that this is very nicely uh, designed. If you look at a flower, if you look at a, a, a sunrise or a sunset, it's very tasty. You see, you, you, you are getting experience, you are getting a feeling of uh, that this is very pleasing, very pleasing to the senses. Whereas if you look at a dead body splattered all over the road, then it's not very pleasing, is it? That same thing. The body which is so beautiful, but if it's in a different condition, you see, just like if you... If you uh, have a body which is very nicely decorated with a nice figure and beautiful clothes and nice perfume, etc. But when the same body is splattered somewhere, you don't want it. Because we are after, what we're actually looking for is perfection. We are looking for perfection in an imperfect world. You see, we are trying to find something perfect in the imperfect. So therefore, the nature of Maya, illusion, is that she uh, covers over the uh, knowledge of the living entity. And this is called condition, conditional life. We are put into different conditions. Just like every body has a certain conditioning. Someone is uh, conditioned by the fact that they were born in a particular country, they were brought up just like uh, psychology. They always bring you back to your childhood, isn't it? They always bring you back to your childhood to find out what experiences you had, which made you like you are now. Isn't it? Psychology. This is called conditioning. If you are brought up by a very dominant parent or a very cruel parent, then you'll have psychotic uh, disturbances or you may be uh, 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 in some way uh, psychologically disturbed. And you find that if you are brought up 
in a very poor country, in a very uh, neglectful way, then there should be other types of disturbances. So these are called conditions. The living entity is conditioned. And these conditions, they are actually the, uh, uh, brought about on account of association with matter. Actually, we have nothing to do with these conditions. We have nothing to do with the material condition. The material condition is a phantasmagoria. It is only lasting, just like when you were a child, so many different conditions you were in. You were at school, you were five years of age, you were quarreling over the duck in the pond or something like that. There's plastic ducks, you know? You see children fighting over these little ducks. All of these things you've done, you've gone through so many different situations. Now they're all simply a dream. You see, everything you've done, it was only a dream. It didn't have any significance. It's just a creation from your mind, in one sense. But you create so many different situations. Uh, like now, we see that we are thinking that I am a 20-year-old or a 30-year-old, and I am this and I am that, and this is my mother, this is my father, this is my brother, this is my sister. I'm English, I'm Irish, I'm French, I'm Spanish. I'm Portuguese. Someone else is thinking I'm a porcupine or I'm a vegetable or I'm a fruit. Whatever. You see? Somebody is thinking I'm an elephant. <laughs> so, so these are all different uh, disturbances of the mind. You see? They're all actual disturbances of the mind. The mind has nothing to do... The, the uh, soul has nothing to do with the mind. It has nothing to do with the material body. Just like our material body, we can understand that at night time we are sleeping, but our, our mind is creating so many things. Sometimes we've been attacked by a tiger, sometimes we're running after money, falling in love, jumping off a mountain, flying in the sky. So many things are going through the mind. But in actuality, the body is doing nothing, lying there, doing nothing. But the mind is still active. So the mind is actually uh, the uh, constant companion of the living entity. But the, both the physical and subtle, the mind means the false ego and uh, the intelligence. So from the mind, one can become degraded or one can elevate himself. We can see that practically. In this life, we can become degraded. It's not difficult to become degraded. You can go take intoxication, hang out with the wrong sort of people, uh, gradually, gradually you become degraded. <clears throat> and also we can become elevated by the mind, but it depends upon association. So therefore we have to choose the type of association that we want. If we want to associate with the mundane, if we want to associate with the temporary world, if we want to come under the clutch of maya, illusion, then we make that choice. We have a choice. We cannot blame God for our predicament. Just like in the material world, when someone is successful, then they blame themselves for their success, isn't it? They say, well, due to my good scheming and my business sense and due to my uh, uh, wonderful brain, I was able to make all these millions. Well, when everything goes wrong, they blame it on God. As soon as things go wrong, they say, there couldn't be a God, how could he do something like this? You see? They don't give God credit for creating all the beautiful beach resorts and holiday camps and beautiful big skyscrapers and whatever. But they say that God, he creates all the misery. He gets all the blame. They get all the credit and he gets the blame. You never see anyone giving God the credit for creating uh, the um, uh, jumbo airplane. But when it crashes, they give him the blame. Isn't it? How could God do that to these poor women and children and men that were sitting in this nice airplane watching TV or cinema and having their dinner? How could he do such a horrible thing? But when they bring in Concord, God doesn't even get a mention. It's not until it crashes. So that's the nature of the living entity that we want to take the credit, but we don't want to take the blame. But actually the Bhagavad Gita explains that we are in our condition because of our own fault. We have no one to blame. 
Whatever situation you're in in this world, you are there because of your fault and your fault only. So this idea that God, God creates catastrophe, no, he doesn't. Actually, God arranges catastrophe because that is what you are due. Just like in, the, in, the, in this country, they arrange the prison house, not because people want to go to prison, isn't it? It's not because that everyone's queued up for some holiday in, in the prison. You see, the prison is there because of the activities, because of the uh, rebellious activities of a certain uh, small number of uh, citizens. If the citizens uh, refuse um, to acknowledge the authority of the laws of the state, then they become criminal and they have to be subjected to punishment. The idea of the punishment is actually... Excuse me. The idea is the punishment is to reform. You don't put people in prison because you want them in prison. You put them in prison because you want to reform their character. You want to reform their nature. So human form of life is the opportunity to reform yourself. You have to reform yourself. If you don't, then again you will have to go down into repeated birth and death in various types of species. Because you will be dragged there by the mind. You see? The mind in association with the modes of material nature is uh, creating 800, 8,400,000 different types of bodies. So just like when you go into, sometimes you see people in a, in a shop, there's all different types of clothes. If you want to be a lumberjack, you buy a lumberjack stuff. If you want to be a, 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 a builder on a building site, you buy a building site. If you want to go to the discotheque and show off, you buy those clothes. If you want to be a, a judge, you buy those clothes. If you want to be an actor on the theater, you buy those clothes. You see? If you want to go swimming on the beach, you buy those clothes. Isn't it? So the clothes are according to the desire. It's not that you create the people to fit the clothes. You understand? It's not that you create all these different types of clothes and then try to create people to fit in them. So similarly, the gross is coming from the subtle. The subtle creates the gross. And then the gross dictates to the subtle. This is the what we call the samsara, the process of samsara, the interreaction between subtle and gross energy. So just like we create a pub, but then when we go to the pub, we get dictated by the pub what we're going to do. You see, people create the pub. What is the pub? People like to go to the pub, isn't it? Once you enter the pub, then there's a little disco music, some drinking alcohol, some meat eating, some intoxication, smoking. You see? So once people go into the pub, they become a victim of the gross. And then their subtle mind is thinking, oh, I better go and get another drink. I better have a smoke. I better eat some meat. I better go and chat that girl up and see that if she's ever met such a handsome guy as me before. <laughs> How lucky she is. I better go and tell her how lucky she is to be in the same bar as a guy like me. So this is the way the, the, the subtle is being dictated by the circumstances. You see? And then implication. As soon as you implicate with that, you get subjected to karma. Karma is the reaction from the action. So then this reaction causes more action. You go up to the beautiful girl, talk to her, and then she says, okay, let's go and have dinner, and then you go to a restaurant, and you spend all your hard-earned money, and then she buzzes off. <laughs> Thanks for the meal, or something like that. And then the guy is left there on the middle of the road, stranded, all his money gone, thinking that he would get some more, further pleasures. So that's similar like in the material world. We come in here, we are here for a very short duration of time, we are concocting so many different dreams that we're going to do this and we're going to do that and things are going to get better and things are looking good now. You know, I just got a pay rise and uh, this thing and that thing. And then gradually we see that all of these phantasmagorias, they gradually, gradually disappear. And all we're left with is old age, bronchitis, lumbago, arthritis, you see? Uh, what do you call uh, demented? What is that? Uh, 
So that's what we get left with. After all that running around, endeavoring, all that bringing up family and everything, all we get left is this, this uh, some senile dementia, whatever it is. You see, that's the result. So we should, intelligence means to learn, at least learn from others' mistakes. If you can't even learn from your own, look at others. The best intelligence is to hear. You see? The best intelligence is to hear. By hearing from the transcendental plane, then one can immediately be picked up. One can immediately be picked up from this uh, mundane world. So this transcendental sound is descending from the highest plane. And that plane is beyond the uh, interreaction of matter. It is beyond the forces of time. It is beyond past, present and future. This transcendental knowledge is coming from another plane where there is no birth, no old age, no disease, no death, where there is no anxieties. This is called Vaikuntha. Vaikuntha means where there is no anxieties. And that plane is the actual plane upon which the soul actually exists in its eternality. Satchitan and the Vigraha. So therefore, that plane is called Vaikuntha. Vaikuntha means where there is no actual hostility. There is no hostility. Why is there no hostility? Because that is the natural function of the soul to live in a, in, in a uh, conducive environment. The reason that we're always looking for a conducive environment is because we belong in one. At the moment we're like fishes out of water. We actually belong in a conducive environment. We belong in a conscious environment. The spiritual world is fully conscious and therefore everything reciprocates completely and perfectly. In the material world, things do not reciprocate because they are inert. They're not conscious. Just like if you go into a room and someone, uh, it goes before you and they slap the door in your face. So you become very annoyed. How rude. How unconscious of that person to do that. You see? So you see that when people are not conscious of you, then there becomes disturbance. So similarly, matter is not conscious of you. Matter is an inert substance which you are trying to manipulate by the uh, egotistic uh, uh, desire. But matter does not actually reciprocate with you. You are trying to make it reciprocate. This is called the struggle for existence. Because we want everything to reciprocate with our desire. And therefore we are full of anxiety because actually nothing is reciprocating with our desire. Nothing. Our desire is to be happy and we find that in the material world, uh, practically speaking, there is very little happiness. Very little. And the predominant happiness in the material world comes from reciprocation. This is called rasa. So therefore we are in an inferior environment, inanimate environment, and therefore we are animate living entities. We are animate. We should study the nature of animation. What is the nature of animation? Is that it is personal. The characteristics of animation is consciousness. Anything which is animate has consciousness. It has some sort of reciprocation. It has desires, feelings like that. So therefore we can study the nature of animation, we can understand that the soul is animated, but at the moment he is mixed up with an inanimate substance. And uh, this inanimate substance is causing so much uh, uh, disturbance, because uh, we are wanting to uh, bring the energy under a certain degree of subjugation so that it will, so will reciprocate with us. That is called trying to control. The reason we try to control is because we want something to reciprocate with us. Isn't it? That's why everyone is trying to control. And unless we can have control, we cannot have reciprocation. So therefore, in the material world, that control comes with a great struggle because actually the material energy is always more powerful. Mama Maya Duratiya. 
So Krishna explains in the Bhagavad Gita that actually you can never control the material energy. You are always controlled by it. And therefore your nature is your servant, where our nature is to serve. But instead of serving our mind, instead of serving our material desires, we should try to serve the controller of this material world. That is Krishna. That is God. So therefore, after many, many lives of struggle in the material world, uh, where we are trying to create so many different uh, situations, then finally one should come to understand that Vasudeva Sanamriti, that Krishna Vasudeva is everything, Sanamriti, um, that he is the end all and be all of everything. And therefore, uh, this uh, uh, the small, tiny, living entity should understand that my real business is to establish my relationship with Vasudeva. Krishna. And that relationship is one of service. You see? Uh, that relationship between the living entity and Krishna is service. We are never the dominator. We are never the controller. We are always the servant. So therefore Krishna says, Sarva dhamma pritya ja mame kam saranam raja aham tam sarva pape bio mukshishami masucha He says that uh, Give up all uh, your speculations. You see? Give up everything. Everything that you're speculating with in your mind, give it up. It has never brought you happiness and it will never bring you happiness. If speculation was able to bring you happiness, then everyone would be very happy because everyone spends their whole time speculating. Isn't it? So if speculation was going to bring happiness, then the whole world would be rolling around in ecstasy. But people spend their whole life speculating and it brings them nothing. It doesn't actually bring them any tangible happiness. It brings them anxiety. You see? Because our ability to speculate is very tiny. We are very, very tiny speculators. And therefore... We have very tiny ability to control energy. We try to speculate in ways of controlling, but we are very, very tiny. We have a tendency to commit mistakes. We have a tendency to be illusioned. We have a tendency of cheating. And we have imperfect ability. So therefore, everything we do, it is always covered by this imperfections. Imperfection. So therefore we see that instead of actually finding solutions to our problem, we actually increase the problems because the process is, is dysfunctional, it's wrong. Therefore, the business in the material world is we have to hear. We have to submit ourselves to higher sound because that sound, if it is coming from the pure plane, then that sound can actually give us perfect truth. If the knowledge is perfect and it's coming from a perfectly pure source, then that knowledge can actually free us from illusion. Therefore, Krishna consciousness, as Krishna is saying, Sarva Dharma Prithyaja Mame Kam Saranam Raja. Mame Kam Saranam Raja means you surrender to me. Because why should we surrender to Krishna? Because Krishna says uh, that, uh, that I am the supreme controller. Uh, that I am the one who is dictating. I am dictating this energy. I am dictating. I am actually dictating uh, the laws of nature. So therefore, uh, we simply have to submit ourselves to Krishna because He is the controller. He is the controller of the material energy and He is the controller of the mind. You see? We cannot actually control our mind. Only God can control our mind. To think that we can control our mind is another audacity. <coughs> it's another audacity. Just like we are trying to control material nature. But we cannot even control our own mind. What to speak of material nature. So therefore, this is an arrogance on the part of the living entity. The living entity is controlled by earth, water, fire. You see? Just like your body is made up of earth and water. But you're spending your whole life serving that body. Isn't it? 
From the moment you're born until you die, you spend your whole life serving the body. And what does the body do? It simply decays. After all that service you've given it, after all those plates of food and all that makeup you put on it and all that cleaning it and washing it and combing it and pampering it, and then it just starts to rot right there in front of you. It's not very grateful, is it? Is it? It just decays right there in front of your very eyes. And then as it decays, it starts to smell and more decay and then finally dwindles. All you got left with is a few bones and a bit of skin hanging on. Isn't it? That's the reality. You see old people when they're about 86, what their body looks like? So therefore you are being controlled by this body. You're not the controller, you're the servant of the body. You're the servant. You have taken up service of earth, water, fire, air, ether. You have taken up service of your mind, your false ego. But these things will never bring you pleasure. They will never bring you satisfaction. They will only bring you hostility, anxiety. So therefore, Krishna consciousness means to understand that actually I should use my mind to serve Krishna. I should use this body this bag of skin and bone, I should use it to serve Krishna. I must use my intelligence to serve Krishna. I should use material energy to serve Krishna. I must use everything for his satisfaction. Why? Because he is the controller, he is the creator, he is the enjoyer. But to do that, I need to be very broad-minded. Mahatma. Mahatma means very broad-minded. Because in the material world we're all very narrow-minded. Duratma. We are thinking that I am the I am the center of the universe, that I'm very important, that I'm very significant, that my happiness is paramount. There's nothing more important in this universe than my happiness, me. Everything else can go to hell. But I must be happy. This is the general kind of consciousness. So therefore, the nature is that we want to uh, bring everything to serve us. But we are being cheated. Nothing will serve us. Things will simply inflict some misery upon us. And this is the grace of Krishna. This is the mercy of Krishna. Don't think that your suffering is something negative. It is very positive. You see, it is there to warn you, don't go down this road. See, just like if you're going down a very dark road and you know that there's tigers and lions or uh, jungle animals, then you don't run down there, do you? You become very uh, introspective. Should I go down there? I heard there's dangerous snakes. I may get bitten by a, a, a tarantula or I may get attacked by a wild lion. So you become very introspective. So the material world is like that. The hostility of the material world is to make you think. To make you think that should I go down this path? Should I go there? Look, what is waiting down there? Old age, disease, death, so many negative things. Therefore, the intelligent person can understand that I should not follow this path. I should not go down this road, but rather I should go to the other road. What is that? I should elevate my consciousness to go back to home, back to God. By chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Rama, Hare Rama, 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 Hare Hare. So, as Krishna said, for him who has conquered the mind, the mind is the best of friends, but for one who has failed to do so, his mind will remain the greatest enemy. So conquering of the mind is when we surrender the mind to Krishna. As soon as you surrender your mind to Krishna, then the mind actually becomes your greatest friend. And as soon as you uh, try to uh, serve your mind, as soon as you try to dominate matter, to manipulate matter, to utilize matter, then your mind becomes the worst enemy. No greater enemy than the mind. There's no greater suffering than the mind. Any disease that you get in this world, it is nothing to the misery of the mind. That's because the mind is the, the key factor 
And therefore Krishna inflicts the maximum displeasure from the mind so as that you do not take shelter of that mind. So that's his cause of mercy. So, because if you take shelter of your mind, then you may again be degraded down into various species. So therefore, Krishna makes your mind the most unfriendly, so as that you can understand, I should not befriend this person. You see, just like if you're with a very nasty person, then you don't want to be with him. Isn't it? You don't want to be with him. So similarly, this material world is a nasty place, actual nasty. But we are thinking somehow or other we can change it. But actually this material world is no place for a gentle, a gentleman, as Sri Bhakti Siddhanta Sankrataki is saying. Because it is hostile to our real interest. And therefore we should not try to associate with this. So basically the best thing to do with the mind is to engage in Krishna service. Don't try to associate with it. It's not you. Just like you don't try to associate with your skin or your body because it's not you. So similarly you have to move on to another level where you don't associate with the mind. But our trouble is that we want to absorb ourselves in the mind. And then we're wondering why we are suffering. So therefore the mind should be always engaged. Because if the mind is not engaged properly in Krishna's service, then it becomes the greatest enemy. Because then it degrades you. It will degrade you. You see, the mind, can, it has to be doing, it's either elevating you or degrading you. There's no real in between. So therefore, if you're not elevating yourself, you're degrading yourself. <clears throat> so Prabhupada said, it is stressed herein that the mind must be so trained that it can deliver the conditioned soul from the mind of nations. In material existence, one is subjected to the influence of the mind and the senses. In fact, the pure soul is entangled in the material world because the mind is involved with the false ego, which desires to lord it over material nature. Therefore, the mind should be trained so that it will not be attracted by the glitter of the material nature. And in this way, the conditioned soul may be saved. One should not degrade oneself by attraction to sense objects. The more one is attracted by sense objects, the more one becomes entangled in material existence. The best way to disentangle oneself is to always engage the mind in Krishna consciousness. That uh, the, the, the best way to disentangle oneself from the mind is to always engage the mind in Krishna consciousness. Hmm. So therefore, the only way that the mind actually can be uh, free from the material attraction is by tasting superior attraction. And the most superior attraction is Krishna. So therefore, if one can actually become attracted to Krishna, then one can be saved from the degradation of the mind. But if one does not become attracted to Krishna, then one cannot be saved. Because... The material energy is so powerful that if you're not attracted to Krishna, then you will become attracted to the material world. So, is there any questions at all? I know the souls in the heart, the super soul. And that's you know? It. No, no, I've been told right in the book. I've been told. Okay, I thought you knew. <laughs> and it's spread, the, and I've been told it's been spreading the consciousness for the whole body. I just want to know how the body and the soul kind of relate, how it kind of relates, and how the mind and the soul relate, and how the soul spreads the consciousness through the body. The thing is, your body is subtle and gross. There are two bodies. You have a subtle body, which is your intelligence, force, ego, and the mind. And then you have your gross body, which is your skin and bone and all these other things. So, consciousness is actually, has nothing to do with the subtle or gross body. These are alien elements. Consciousness actually originally is coming from the soul, just like sunshine is coming from the sun. But if you uh, put this sunshine through uh, a glass prism, then they, when it comes through the prism, it will come out different colors. You see? So originally the color of the sun 
is pure, but when it comes in contact with the glass, it becomes transformed. Similarly, consciousness originally is pure, but when it contacts with the subtle and gross elements, then it becomes pervertedly manifested in false ego. And uh, that false ego is the false identification with matter as a reality. So, the connection between the soul and the body is, is coming from the false ego of the mind. Therefore, Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Ahankara Vimuratma, that by identification with the false ego, one identifies with the, the mind. The mind means that this is the subtlest point of identification, is your mind. You are thinking, I am this body, I am this mind. My name is Timmy Harrison. I belong to Swindon. This is my mom, this is my dad, this is Pussycat. <laughs> See? So these are all uh, coming from false ego. You're not Timmy Harrison, you don't belong to Swindon and you don't belong to that cat. You actually belong eternally in the spiritual world of Krishna. But because you've been lit, you're, you're weak intelligence, therefore you're listening to the dictations. You see, you're listening to the dictations. So the dictation is constantly saying, no, no, you are Timmy Harrison. You do belong to Swindon. This is mom, this is dad. You see? So over millions and millions and millions and millions of lifetimes, you've been listening to this mind. So now you have a chance to stop. But because it's con conditional life is over billions of births, therefore it's very difficult to stop. It's not an easy thing to stop the dictation of the mind. But only when you can realize your real ego, when you can understand that actually when you have practical realization, not sentimental idea, but actual practical realization that I am the eternal servant of Krishna, then you have no longer, then your mind becomes Vrindavan. As Lord Chaitanya said, I don't have a mind. My mind is Vrindavan. So then, when you're in Vrindavan, then you know who you are. Until then, you have to engage yourself in sadhana bhakti, regulated bhakti, regulated devotional service, so as the mind doesn't become your enemy. So you have to keep it friendly. So friendly means that it should engage it in, in activities which are conducive to the soul. Just like the materialists, they are doing activities which are conducive to the body, isn't it? They're very busy doing activities conducive to the body. So we are very busy, very busy doing activities which are conducive to the soul. That's the only difference. There's no other difference between us and the karmis. The only difference is they're doing activities conducive to their bodies and we're doing activities conducive to our soul. And by those conducive activities to the soul, you would get the mercy of Krishna. No other way. So, if we engage ourselves in, uh, in the, the devotional service of Krishna, then Krishna, yeyam mam as they, as they serve me, I reward them accordingly. You see? Any other questions? Any arguments? Points? I just thought I'd make a comment that it's just like when you said earlier on about that everyone blames God when something goes wrong and it comes to disaster. Actually, even I noticed uh, in this insurance document that an act of God is an actually legal term. So, like, yeah. disaster, so even everyone considers. Like yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's the nature. They want to, they, they're very quick to blame, but not to give credit. You see, even the atheists will blame God. Because as soon as anything goes wrong, everyone goes, oh God. Isn't it? In other words, when things go wrong, then God comes into the picture. But when they go right, who cares about God? You see? So that's their nature. Because everybody knows there's a God. Everybody knows there's a God. It's just that they don't want to admit it. But if they are going to admit it, at least admit it when everything goes wrong. That and get the blame. Put the uh, blame on him. But that's the nature, you see. 
Uh, but when things go right, it's got nothing to do with God. Carmen Mumsday was my my acts that brought about this, uh, just like we always think that because I did this, because I did that, therefore, how wonderful I am. But then when it goes wrong, then we curse God. We said, we never blame. Nobody likes to blame themselves for anything. Any other questions? Um, Lord Chaitanya was Radha and Krishna combined, but uh, he was also feeling in separation from Krishna, which, which kind of confused me a bit, because I'm very stupid, so it's nice if you can explain. <laughs> Lord Chaitanya is the internal manifestation of the combination of the, of the love between Radha and Krishna. So, the when Krishna wanted, Krishna you see is God, Krishna is unlimited. He has unlimited uh, ability. But devotional service is so unlimited that even the unlimited can't understand how unlimited devotional service is. So therefore Krishna wanted to understand the love that Srimati Radharani has for him. So he couldn't, even though he's God, he could not understand the depth of that love because it was so deep. So therefore, in order to understand that love, he uh, manifested himself as Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya is the, if you like, the personification of the love that is there, the attraction. It's actually the, the personification of the, tra- the attraction that Radharani feels for Krishna. So therefore, he's in the mood of separation. Because the highest type of feeling in the spiritual world is separation. There's no higher. Just like now, you are separated from your cat. So you, you remember your cat better, isn't it? But when you're there, there's also a feeling. But when you're away, then there's even more feeling. Oh, if only I saw my mom, my dad, this and that, so many things, or my girlfriend, or whatever attraction is there. So when you're away from it, it's even stronger. It's more subtle, but it's actually stronger. Familiarity breeds content, even in the material world. When people are near each other, the intensity is not so much. After a while, of course, that's not to say in the spiritual world the same thing, but it's a crude example that in the material world, that there is a little bit of familiarity. But then when there's separation, then there's intensity. So this is called Vipralambha. So Lord Chaitanya is showing the uh, highest uh, manifestation of Vipralambha, separation in love. Uh, this is a very esoteric subject uh, to understand that uh, how Lord Chaitanya is the personification of the love of uh, the attraction between Srimati Radharani and Krishna. But you can read it. You can read teachings of Lord Chaitanya, uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita. Okay, Shiva Bhagavad Gita Kija, Jai Kopa, Kija.